right on this one. I'm going to do just a summary for. Okay. Jessica is in Castlewood, Virginia, growing mushrooms and hopefully some flowers and herbs. Yes. So this is the purpose of this workshop is to just narrow down and one, what are we growing for cash for the most bang for our efforts this year? And this is really important to farmers, important to gardeners. My name is Nikki Schauder. I'm the co-founder of Permaculture Gardens. And I've been growing for maybe 15 years, um, teaching in, from a tiny townhouse to a farm, now farm. Uh, what led us to this is allergies of our kids and a broken food system, which is the expertise of Liz here. So Liz, for the past 20 years, has been working to make local direct farm food more accessible to American communities. This involves her advocacy work on both the state and federal levels, listening to farmers about what they are going through and what they need most, really battling court cases alongside them even. And 18 years ago, because of this, broken food system, she created her own buying club for people here in the DC, the Washington DC region, where she sources from local farms, offers consulting to those farmers and makes sure that people in the, our communities have the options to choose from these farms. So if you're a farmer and you're local to the uh, Maryland, the Washington DC area, please connect with Liz afterwards, we will show you how. Um, for, and even if you're just a farmer who's struggling, she is a farm advocate. <laughs> That's her other, other um, hat. So go take it away, Liz, and and tell us. Oh, before that, we'll do our agenda. So we just introduced ourselves, um, and I hope that you guys are introducing yourselves in the chat. So Serena is from Harrisonburg, Virginia, growing mixed annual veggies and herbs. I also don't have a functional mic. And Ryan, welcome. And Jordan from Parish, Alabama. We are currently growing okra, two loofah loofa growers here. Not just you, Ryan, but um, someone else. I can't remember her name, but we will find you, loofah growers. And um, Liz has some tips for you. <laughs> Gore. That looks like Bella is the other loofah grower. Yes, Bella. Yes, Bella. And she's an amazing, yeah, she has a lot of, like Della is an, ex an expert gardener. She has a lot of uh, years of gardening behind her. All right, so oh, I didn't do that well. What people want to buy is what we're going to talk. Liz is going to lead the discussion on that one. How to choose your cash crops. That's me. How we can maximize profit. That's both of us, me and Liz. And then we'll take your questions. And then we want to really solidify, we don't want you to leave without with just being bombarded with information. We want you to leave with some concrete next steps and that's what we'll end with. So I already talked about that. I'm from Permaculture Gardens. Liz is from Nourishing Liberty. And, and it's so great to be here with you all. And Nikki, thanks for hosting this incredible series of workshops. I know this is on a lot of farmers' minds right now. So thanks for providing that. And it's great to be here and meet everybody. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started with what people want to buy. This is kind of a big topic for a lot of farmers these days. A uh, big can of worms sometimes. In a way, if you're selling anything, you're not looking for what people say they want to buy. You're looking for what people are actually buying. The truth is in what they do not say. And it's kind of a, a, a tough thing to get around some people because people think one thing, but they actually might do another. So it's really important to observe that. And yes, it's also super important to focus on your audience. No one is saying to sell Twinkies. That's not your audience, right? You need to know your audience well enough to know that they will buy and what this market segment is about. So listening is key, it is important, but also observing what they're actually buying. And what I've learned from 20 years now of serving my community with local foods, people want to buy food they're familiar with. And there's a huge demand right now for super niche ethnic foods. And 
as a supplier of some of these, I cannot even tell you how many times I provide a food to a certain customer or community and they come back to me and they say, thank you so much. This tastes like home. All right. And with the incredible diversity we have in our country, both as people who live here and visitors, people want to connect. They want to reconnect to their memories. They want to connect with people here and have a strong emotional connection to their homes and those memories. And by giving them a sense of belonging and reminding them of the place they love, you will endear yourself to them. Ultimately, and please remember this, this is a huge takeaway for you. People want connection and they buy based on emotion. And yes, they want to buy good food <laughs> and they want a connection to come with that. So consider for a moment, let your mind go there. Consider some of the things you buy, especially anything local. You also have other needs that are being met in that. Maybe a sense of connection or of belonging. So the more you can provide people with options, food options, or if you're selling uh, non-food, locally grown things, but options that also fulfill the connection and the belonging piece, the better you will do. Think about what else you offer that can provide people with that value. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later too. How does this manifest in your particular operation? Are you giving them a place to meet others or a way for them to show their values? Workshops or farm walks or even forest bathing, right? And if you're providing more of an experience, how does that experience connect them to their desires? I'll give you an example. I teach mushroom log workshops. And the first mushroom log workshop I did, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm marketing this to a very small segment. And uh, okay, I'll, I, I tailored it for about 15 people. And I put it out there and it filled up so fast that we actually ended up making it for, we, we had a double session for that first time and we ended up having about over 60 people total. And that left me scrambling for enough logs. <laughs> I guess that's a good problem to have because people wanted that connection. They wanted to be part of it themselves. And one observation I made on that, uh, which was not necessarily a buying observation, but um, after they had completed their mushroom logs, it was really funny because I told people bring a blanket or a towel or something to keep your car from getting dirty as you're bringing your mushroom log home. But when, what ended up happening is people took that blanket or the sheet or the towel out and wrapped their log up like a baby. And all of them were carrying their logs like babies. And it was, I mean, it was an incredible observation because it wasn't just like one person doing that. It was the majority. Uh, so think about things like that. Watch as people are making these connections. But I was shocked at how popular the mushroom log workshop was after literally creating a, something that was supposed to be a very small scale event and people were so attracted to it. And of course we've done more because of that and they've all been popular, but find those things that people wanna to connect to. Another way to look at this is to keep in mind how people are categorizing how they're spending. So for example, some of you are selling food and the mushroom logs could be seen as maybe coming out of the food budget, but for the most part, I don't think anybody used money out of their food budget to pay for those mushroom log workshops. So think about as you're telling the story of what you're producing and as you're selling it and as you're creating your marketing strategy for it, think about the needs and wants of that customer segment, that customer base, and think about what budget it might be coming out of. Is it coming out of the gift budget? Another example of that is one of the farms I work with sells honey and they sold a jar of honey this big. So it was like maybe two pounds of honey, but it, the jar was beautiful. It had like etched glass sunflowers in it. 
And they sold that for 50 bucks, like a lot, not just one. And so clearly people are not spending that kind of money on their food budget, right? That goes into a different budget. So as you're working on creating your events or your CSA shares or your product offerings, think about if there's different ways you can categorize what you're selling so that people are pulling from different types of their budget. That's great. All right, Nikki, you're going to talk about how to choose our plants. Yes. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't do your next slide. Oh my goodness. People make emotional decisions. Connection oh. to recap, right? Yes. It's all about connection. That's why those live events are important. Uh, and I'd love to know who among you here are coming. I know location wise, that's not possible for many of you, but some of you, but those of you who are local to Virginia, who might be being able to visit Bethany farm and, and uh, be here live for the March 9th culminating workshop. What do you buy and why? And look at what people do, not what they say. So thinking about your audience, your mark, your, who your, your clients and your customers. Now we go to choosing your plants. Um, great slides, Liz. That's <laughs> all these Liz made. So here are some key questions that I implore you to ask um, before you make your plant list. What do you like to eat? What is easy to grow? What is expensive to buy? And what is rare or hard to find? And we'll go through these categories one by one. But first, what is it? Take a minute to write down what you and your family want to eat. And I have a timer for one minute, starting now. Sometimes we'll, we get excited and we grow things and then nobody eats them. <laughs> and then they go to the compost bin. Sometimes the easy things to grow, our family doesn't like. Feel free to share them too in the chat if you'd like. What do you and your family like to eat? Potatoes, corn, green beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, absolutely. Five seconds. And that's it. All right. So that hopefully prompts some like, wait, why am I not growing this? We eat a lot of this. Uh, garlic, onions, you know, things of that nature. Eggs. So here are here's a chart that Dave had put up together on an old blog of ours before that I haven't yet re revamped and put in on our website. But um, these are prices that were before the pandemic. And it's just to show you kind of the trends, which I think still persist now. And, and Liz, you can correct me if I'm wrong of certain things and how they're priced. So he he put like medium, low, high, low prices for things in general. So low would be these prices. Like I said, these prices are probably not the same now, or maybe they are, but um, lettuce, for instance, is mediumly priced, uh, but easy to grow. Spinach, oh, kale is expensive, but easy to grow. So it should be, these should be things that we, um, we think about when we are growing our food is what is easy to grow or what do you like to eat what is easy to grow and what is expensive to buy and in this chart these are fruiting crops this time um he puts in like what uh the, the things that is most expensive here is tomato <laughs> tomatoes are hard and that's why some of you have it as your cash crop they are expensive to buy they're expensive to buy fresh but they're you know I don't want to say easy, they're, they're medium to grow because especially if you grow them from seed and not seedling, and especially if they're heirloom kinds that are hard to find and you have the space to grow them. So this year was the, this past 2023 was the first year that I was able to can 13 jars, uh, 13 weeks, so more than that, 26, because we take, we consume about 22 jar, two jars of tomatoes a week is my average. 
And for 13 weeks till January, we were not buying any canned tomatoes because we had them from our own store. And so this is what I want for you guys too. Tomatoes is clearly a cash crop and herbs are clearly cash crops, as you can see from here, because they're easy to grow relatively, okay? Rosemary, thyme, lavender, those guys, a little bit finicky depending on your soil and your um, location, but it's, it's um, and, and it says it's low, so maybe not that. So rosemary, thyme, lavender, unless you want them fresh <laughs> or you wanna make your own household cleaners, things like that, or they just make you happy, you know? Basil, parsley are great. So let me see what you guys have been seeing. Rachel, Rachel, cucumbers, carrots, broccoli, summer squash, zucchini, winter squash. Yes. All right. Thanks for sharing, guys. And then um, this is an example, not of a cash crop, but of a crop that supports the growth of the cash crop. A Jerusalem artichoke. And it's the, um, it's a native American perennial, a native perennial, meaning it grows here naturally in America. Um, and yet it's a pollinator plant. You can use it so many functions. You can use it as cut flower. You can use it as a pollinator attractant. It is low starch. It's a carb substitute um, in small amounts. It's sort of like a delicacy, you know, if, if you find a restaurant that might want it. <laughs> Inulin source. So for those who are diabetic, that is a, something that's positive. And I put here jugulone blocker. Who knows what jugulone is? Anyone? Isn't it given off by like walnuts that um, makes the certain plants not want to um, grow in the area? Exactly. Very good, Vivian. I knew you would be the one to answer this. You're right. So I have um, the, the reason I put this out here is because we've visited a, a farm in Portland, which is an urban farm right in the middle of the outskirts of uh, Portland, Oregon. And they were give, given this, this land by the government, local government to use for production. And so the farmers who are permaculture people took the land and, and they, at first, you know, it was full of black walnuts surrounding this area that would have been a parking lot. And so they had put this barrier instead of different plants among which the most dominant of them were these Jerusalem artichokes or uh, Helianthus tuberosus. So they would line the perimeter and it would block the jugulone and they were able to grow their cash crops within that circle of um, interior huh, shielded by this plant. So another example of a supporting crop is peas and nitrogen fixers that are legumes. So many of us may or many of us may already know this, but legumes like peas and beans fix nitrogen in the soil for their fellow crops. So if you have a tomato growing there and you happen to have a plant that also fixes nitrogen, like a bean or a, a pea before it that precedes the tomato because of the seasonality of these crops, then you have the likelihood of more nitrogen for your tomato to start off with, or your leafy greens, especially nitrogen is especially helpful for leafy greens. And so I always, um, I always remind people in a GIY program, every bed should have a legume in it, <laughs> no matter what the season is, every bed should have a legume. And this could very well in Virginia be a peanut. You know, we are the sixth largest producing uh, peanut producers, I believe, in the United States. And so peas, peanuts, you get the crop of the peanut and it stores for long. Um, I'm just looking at a different legume. It also fixes nitrogen. This pea, you can use the cut flower for, um, depending on what variety you grow, you know, for for flowers. And, and it's a pollinator attractant during that season in the early spring when you might need pollinators for other things. So that, and then here's something that's more of a novelty crop, which is now ginger and turmeric. Because of our changing climates, you know, we may not have considered growing this, but now this kind of tropical-ish plant will overwinter where we are. Um, so consider that and that it's, uh, even if you're to sell it as like to farmers who want to grow this, it's hard to find these rhizomes in the early spring, for instance, or when you want to, when you want to grow it. 
Um, other hard to find possibilities, I was in Roanoke in January once, that's Roanoke, Virginia, and they had a, it was my birthday, so I went to, we went to a restaurant and uh, I had pawpaw ice cream in the middle of January <clears throat> because that restaurant was smart enough to freeze all the pawpaws <laughs> and turn them into ice cream. I mean, it, could be, it tastes like ice cream, this, this delicious native, largest of Native American fruit does but it also keeps well if you freeze it. It doesn't keep well as this in this form. So kind of looking at those creative ways, fresh figs, fresh ginger. I hope this is all prompting ideas of like, oh yeah, I should grow that. Oh yeah, this is the other thing. Citrus, if you have a greenhouse, hard to find. These things are hard to find and imported. Not for you, Vivian, because <laughs> you're close to like the citrus groves, but um, for the rest of us, and then here we go. Shishito pepper is so trendy. Liz, do you know? Do you agree? Yes. I feel like yeah. it's always in the restaurant menus. Shishito pepper, something, something, and it's so easy to grow. I will not. I kid you not. So easy to grow. Fijoas. I may have spelled that wrong. It's a pineapple guava, which is a tropical fruit, but we're we might be able to grow it here in Virginia, or Kentucky, depending on where you guys are. I know some of you are, are in some southern states that are not in Virginia. And then Lufa. Liz, you want to talk about Lufa a bit? Yeah, I'll talk about Lufa, but also I want to add to that, Nikki, that um, if you are living in an area with any sort of uh, ethnic population or uh, Asian stores, uh, Latin American stores, anything like that, you can find out what it is that people want because there's always a subset of those ethnic populations that want organic. And, and if you think about where people are coming from, what they're accustomed to uh, in terms of growing standards, they're probably not getting it here, right? Because one of the biggest complaints I get from people who come to America from literally everywhere else is how chemicalized and toxic our food is. They can't digest it. They can't eat it. They get sick. And so, you're often going to find a huge number of those ethnic populations who really want the organic, the local, the permaculture based versions of, of the foods they know and love. And if you can see not just what they're saying, remember, but find out what they're actually buying in those stores to see what is the demand for some of those products and can you grow them. Um, and in terms of Lufa, Nikki, I think you wanted me to mention what, uh, how, how to market this, right? Yes. Yeah. A great way to market this, and and I'm seeing it in my areas and the farmers I'm working with, is of course Lufa. One of Lufa's uh, roles is kind of as a, a shower scrub. <laughs> so, if you can partner with another farm that makes soap, like a goat milk soap or uh, coconut oil soap, or partner with another small producer and think of this not as a standalone product, but as something that you market with other complementary products or make your own Epsom salt mix, right? Uh, get a little creative with that. And then in terms of marketing, people, people buy with their eyes, right? And they buy with those emotions. So if you can capture that, that's so pretty reaction from a good number of your customer base. You're going to make those sales in that particular product. And then the added benefit that like gasp afterwards is, oh, you grew this, right? So you're kind of going for that, like kind of going for that mentality, that market segment where, um, I mean, I know you all, everybody knows that, that you can picture somebody in your life right now who's like this, but they go to the farmer's market stand and they see this pretty little display. And then you just made their day by telling them you grew the lufa that goes with it. So think about creative ways to market things based on emotions and based on uh, targeting specific segments. I love that, Liz. I'm thinking about, I mean, having some Filipinos visit here, they're like, I would totally join you if we were to grow like these Filipino vegetables. and. <laughs> All right, so here's some other things. Medicinal herbs are also hard to find. And and if you are in the gr business of growing mushrooms, I know some of you want to or are already growing mushrooms. Uh, reishi is one of those harder things, you know, to get. And I'd say I, I was able to grow it. Like even if it, 
I, I don't say it was easy, but it was weird. It was weird, different to grow. So find those things that are, if it's easy for you though, then you should definitely, um, the, the mushroom, it's hard to find mushrooms other than the porcini, right? In the grocery stores, that's it. They just have that one Bella mushroom and then they have a white version of it, but it's the same kind of mushroom. Um, Ricky, I'll add to that, that mushrooms in general are a great hash crop because they fetch a really high price point yes. and they're hard to find and they're hard to find grown on certain mediums. Like we have one near us who grows soy free and that is a huge demand right now. So yeah. think about any type of mushroom you have the capacity to grow. And you can grow these even out of, you can grow oysters out of toilet paper roll. <laughs> so the input is so low and the, um, you can go direct to say, I'm now I'm going to, you can go direct to the actual restaurants or the gourmet places that want this. Um, but we'll talk about marketing a little bit later on. And then loofah, sorry, that was not a loofah. That was a comfrey. Comfrey. <laughs> so the comfrey is for, uh, just, I just was thinking of this because I had this little, from being so cold, I was like, oh, do I have arthritis? Like all of a sudden my joints swelled, but I put this comfrey salve that I got from friends in Oregon, different friends who are permies there, and they grew a lot of comfrey and they made it into a salve. And I'm like, I need to do this. And I just put it on there and it's, it's fine now. So those kinds of, that's a value added comfrey salve from a plant that grows like a weed wherever you plant it. <clears throat> and then you can also benefit from the compost composting the leaves several times a year and yeah. you get the dynamic accumulator effect as well. So comfrey is like one of my favorite plants and it's such a huge win for any farm, any garden. So even if you're not going to make salve with it, plant some. Yes. And it's like those, one of those supporting crops that wherever you put it, the soil there gets enriched and it draws the bees. So <clears throat> Microgreens, that's what I do. So I became a farmer, I'm a microgreens farmer, and we market straight to restaurants. But I have a friend named Jen, and she was my classmate when I took my permaculture class. Like she literally sat beside me and she grows flowers. And I know some of you want to or are already growing flowers. And that business is totally lucrative. <laughs> she's she's almost embarrassed to say, but I'm not saying that it's a hard business, that's for sure because she doesn't have enough designers on hand, but the flower demand, especially around the wedding season, when the flowers are in season is very high and they will pay a lot of money for it. So um, somebody in the GIY community is actually growing flowers for a wedding of her sister. This is Jen. And this is where I want to just show whatever it is you decide to grow, even if it is tomatoes, okay? Something boring like tomatoes and basil. There's something unique that you can bring that's from you. And this is Jen bringing permaculture into her floral mixes. She is one of like Martha Stewart's top, top 20 or 40, you know, um, designers. But this is how she started before, even before that is she, we took a permaculture and then she has this arrangement of avant-garde <laughs> flowers and mushrooms and succulents, you know, and weeds even all in one bouquet. And so bring what is your talent, kind of try to think what are the things that you uniquely know to the table. So one minute, take write down things, ideas of things you can sell, or if you're not selling them, gift that you haven't thought of before. Five seconds left. And stop. So 
What did you guys all come up with? Share in the chat. Back to that unique and creativeness, I just wanted to highlight five things that you might prompt you to think about your unique advantage over other farmers out there, other gardeners, is your unique experience. No one has your specific experience or your training. I'm looking at Vivian, I'm thinking like, you know, that organization, <laughs> the order, that kind of thing. People are looking for that, that order. And, um, or Rachel, your scientific background and that take on on gardening. <clears throat> Some of you are herbalists, right? You have, you may have herbal knowledge, you can educate your people about your products and say why it's important and that adds value to the product or you know the the people appreciate it more because of that um, your unique take on things no one has your perspective um, your special talent you can incorporate your particular talent like singing even knowledge of history family legacy i know some of you um, mead farms you have a century old farm and so that means you have that history that you need to highlight when you um, when you share about the things that you're selling, your ethnicity, your education. So when you think of a crop to add as your cash crop or your supporting crop, always think one element, several functions, several purposes. One element, multiple functions. That's what Bill Mollison would say. And let me just read what you guys are saying. Okay, paw paw discussions going on. All right. Um, so now we go into how we can maximize profit. Liz, do you want to start us off? Yes. Can you go ahead and switch to the next slide on that one? Okay, so I love that, Nikki, that you were just talking about some of these concepts and how to be uniquely you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, touch on social permaculture here too because it's really hard to find the balance in maximizing profits. As one farmer I was working with said to me one time, yeah, if I charge too much, I'm a farmer without customers. If I charge too little, you're customers without a farmer. And that's, that's the balance we're all finding ourselves in. So finding that is really key. And this also goes hand in hand with finding your ideal customer base and continuing to appeal to them month after month. And I wanna make a really quick distinction here between a buyer and a customer. So if you're at the farmer's market, for example, and somebody randomly comes up to your booth and buys a thing off your table, that's a buyer. And a customer is somebody who keeps coming back and buying week after week or month after month. and literally makes a custom of buying from you. So as you're thinking through all of these dynamics, think about who is that customer base that you can appeal to who can keep returning to you and then creating that base of loyalty because the best thing we can do is have that loyal customer base. That's what every business dreams of, having that loyal customer base. Consider your vision and your goals for your farm, to Nikki's point of what is really and truly 100% uniquely you and how can you express that? Your vision needs to be that driving force to create your goals and then to create the system for profit. And in that, what does profit mean to you? Are you growing for your family and having enough to share qualifies as profit? Or are you using this enterprise to pay your mortgage and taxes and you need to have enough profit to pay from the crops to pay for this? So think about what it actually means to you and get it. I really encourage you to get all of this written down, <laughs> right? That's super important, getting it all written down. Nikki, can you go to the next slide? All right, so how many here since this is a permaculture course. How many here have heard of the eight forms of capital in permaculture? Just a little thumbs up in the chats if you have. Maybe some people, hopefully a few. Okay, so consider your vision and your goals for your farm. And then ask yourself different questions. Yes. 
how do I maximize profit is a really important question. But you also want to ask, how can I add value? And what gives me value? And look at the different forms of capital and how can you weave additional forms of value into your operation? Barter is a classic example, but it doesn't quite go far enough in our modern economy to describe what some might need and the different creative ways to navigate the multiple forms of capital that you can draw on to run your operation and ultimately be profitable from it. You absolutely need to start with the questions around what your vision is and what goals will help you to achieve that vision. So vision is like that big picture I want to go here. And then your goals come out of that vision and they're concrete, measurable, tangible things that you can see. Did I complete this goal? Then those answers will inform which of these forms of capital you can leverage for your operation. And if you're familiar with this concept on the the eight forms of capital, I'll just go through them super quick for those who aren't familiar, Nikki. Social capital is who is your network? Who are your friends? Can you get so-and-so to uh, post something on their social media account? Then what does that look like? Experiential capital is literally what is the, cul the, the whole culmination of experiences you've had in your life and how can you draw on them? Living capital is your trees, your fish in the pond, your cows in the field, uh, the herbs you're growing, that's your living capital. And what, especially what can propagate year after year without additional uh, financial input. Cultural capital, that is the only one that we need more than one person to create. But that's like we're talking about the different ethnic foods. That would be an example of somebody's cultural capital that they can pull from that, that whole cultural base of information. Spiritual capital. Really, how connected are you? What is your spiritual life like? Material capital, that's your chair, your barn, your the stool that you sit on to milk your cow. That's the, the things. And we have so much of that in our uh, ecosystem, shall we say, right now. That might be one of the easiest to come by. Intellectual capital is literally your uh, academic credentials <laughs> and a little bit beyond that. Financial capital, that is, of course, our cold, hard cash. And so as you think about these different forms, how do they interact with each other? How can you trade out? And are you good at organizing? Look at how your personal specific gifts contribute and add value to that larger ecosystem. Do you like the physical labor? Maybe you have land and somebody else has muscle. If you've got the land, but you don't have enough time to work it, and somebody else has plenty of time, but not the land, that is a natural uh, social permaculture relationship that could exist. And be creative here and use these principles of permaculture to find where the unused resources can fit your unmet needs. That right there will help you maximize your profit in any situation. I love that, Liz. And I just wanted to pause to uh, just highlight something that was in the chat. Um, Ryan was sharing, we are wanting to find ways to market the loofah we grow at our home garden, but our cultural context is not necessarily the best environment for that or anything, sh I think he meant short of odd. <laughs> so, so our community garden gives all its food away and Della agreed, she said, same here. So some states have a farm link program to connect the land to the labor. Um, how can you, uh, Ryan, do you want to unmute and just explain a little bit more what you meant by this? Is yeah, this a I, problem? Yeah, absolutely. One yeah, no, I just, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Was this yeah. a problem? Like you want to market, you want to be able to uh, profit financially, for instance, from your your loofahs, but around you, everybody is just giving away for free because it is a community garden and that's the context that you're growing in. Is that right? Oh, no. Oh, okay. I'll clarify. No. So it, it's kind of, we're, we're here, <laughs> we're attending this bootcamp on kind of multiple levels because like we have our home garden, um, which is where we grow, currently grow the loofah, but we have a community garden that we run and are taking steps towards building a full-fledged community farm. 
um, that we'll oversee. And uh, so I was just speaking of two different aspects. So like we, we grow all the stuff at our community garden that goes straight into the community to like feed people. We have serious like food apartheid and insecurity. And so um, that's kind of like a secondary thing. But as far as like on our home garden, we, you know, we grew a bunch of loofah last year and we, we grow a lot of traditional Southern staples as far as like crops go, because here like things that are odd or outside of the norm don't really work well on a local level. And we were actually surprised, I guess, that even loofah didn't seem to work very well. We have a, we have just a ton of loofah <laughs> from last year still. And so it's, one of the struggles I guess for us in that regard is like trying to find how to grow this and use it as a, a cash crop in our own life. Um, when our own immediate kind of local context is not necessarily the right place for those things, if that makes sense. And so, um, thank you so much for clarifying Liz, Do you have something to offer? Yes. Um, just for context, where is your operation? So we're in Parrish, Alabama, which is kind of um, northwest Alabama, or it's northwest central. It's kind of right in the middle of all that. So above the okay. Black Belt and at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, okay. Um, so it sounds like maybe there's an awareness gap also with some of that customer segment. Like they might not even know what um, what it is, right? Yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, anything that's not kind of like a, it, it's it's strange because you, you would think that a lot of people here would grow their own food, but because of just, I think there's a cultural idea around the South, and but like people are so disconnected from food and so disconnected from the land that like if it's not something right. that comes from Walmart, they don't, they don't have the knowledge of it anymore, even if it was something that may have traditionally been grown more here or something that would have been used. And so there's kind of like a cultural knowledge gap around like most of the people we know didn't even know Lufa grew. They thought it was like, I don't know, they, they didn't even know that it was a plant, you know what I mean? So there is kind of um, a gap in, in knowledge and understanding around those things. And, and we didn't necessarily grow them last year to, to like try to sell them. We just wanted to see what it would be like to grow them. And uh, we grew like over 60 very large loofahs off of like four plants <laughs> and uh it was just a lot, um, and it was really fun. So, so this year, don't grow the loofah since you have an, a surplus of them. Grow like another pumpkin, which seems to grow well, because it's a. Cute are you thing. also are you growing it to eat, or are you growing it? The, for... the loofah we're growing to use like soap sponges and shower sponges and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, one one thought initially is if you have any. Um, if you do have any soap makers or, you know, home creatives who do things like this, see about partnering up with somebody else. And then you can maybe sell kind of wholesale type way. But at yeah. least if you, if you want to keep growing loofah for other reasons, then you'd have a market for that and they'd have a, a source for it. Yeah, that's a good idea. I, I think there's probably a a handful or more of like local soap kind of uh, apothecary places. So that's definitely a route we should go. And one, one thing to keep in mind is that it's, it's so, so hard to create demand for a specific product. So you want to go where the demand already is. And if your community and your farmer's market, so to speak, right, as an analogy, doesn't have that demand, look a little further or go back to what your community, like, remember, what are people actually buying? Right. Yeah. And I think for us, it's kind of, it's kind of a weird thing of like the staples, which is like what we want to eat and what our generally our community, which was mostly what we grow in the community garden that goes into the community uh, for free. Um, as far as like the, on the farming level, like we're so, and this, this is part of like finding the niche around all of it too, just to make it sustainable. It's just because like we are dominated kind of by like larger scale farms if there if there are farmers here they're larger scale and so like the staples we would grow they grow in surplus of 50 times what we could ever dream of producing and so it's kind of one of those and, and there's a lot of um kind of um what the the word i'm trying to find it's 
um, good old boy kind of system of like people who have had traditionally been the farmers in this area. And so they kind of have the monopoly on, you know, cowpeas or tomatoes or collards right. or, you know, those kind of things. And so it, it is trying to find it. It, this one reason I guess we thought about lo the loofahs being a potential way because they're not something that's grown around here, but also at the same time, it there was too much of a knowledge gap, I think, um, on the, uh, as far as on the local level. Yes, and Brian, I feel like this conversation is so good and it, it deserves its own like little hour, but I see some connections already. Della, Liz, and you should probably get on a call at a different time to talk brainstorm ideas because I'm this is what Liz helps farmers do is really get heard and connected to buyers and Adela is with the ASD um, the Appalachian Sustainable Development and so and also producing Lufa so with your powers combined I'm sure this is and this is what I want these workshops to do is <laughs> to connect you guys to each other so you can grow more in more ways than one. All right, Perfect. so yes, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm so glad, I'm so glad this is interactive. Um, so down to the crop level, we've looked at the permaculture community sphere and now we're going back again to our gardens. How can we maximize and extend quality production? Cause that's where we, we stand out, right? Doing in our own farms compared to the big large scale mass producers of things they are where their quality is stagnant. Ours can be more personal, more more nit more nutrient dense, more everything, right? Um, more rare, more curated, and so on and so forth. So, one is to extend the harvest. So, if you aren't doing this already, planning your calendar, which will be coming in two weeks after, not after the week after next Wednesdays, will be more on this topic: extending your harvest through planting your planning calendar and using season extenders, um, lowering your inputs. We talked about, we alluded to this already earlier about when we uh, mentioned compost um, and yeah, less inputs, right? You're doing a lot, uh, you're you, you lessening our inputs. That's what every farmer does. And that's where my research in compost tea comes through. So I, I currently am doing research on compost tea and seeing if that could be a viable option for farmers to use. Um, to lower inputs, because then if you're composting already, all you have to do is use the compost to the, you know, squeeze all the compost out through the compost tea. Um, and that's what I'm studying, but details on that in future months to come. Efficient soil system and systems. So I wanted to put efficient soil systems where you are, that again is composting, but efficient systems on its own, like your production as you grow more for your family, even, even at home, your, I would like when we grow, I have to be on standby to spend three hours when we harvest that Napa cabbage in a few days, it's ready. I have to be on standby to do kimchi for three hours. And so well, how can I make that if a system efficient, you know, of, of canning and, and food uh, storage and business management even. And then the value added goods. So we talked about that in the jams that I was um, sharing with you all, uh, what things can you extend? The, the comfrey salve, the bombs, the lip bombs from the beeswax, if you're caring for bees and you have honey already, that in itself, you know, things that store well and that can be converted to things that will store longer are value added. Soap making might be, for all the loofah growers, <laughs> you might, you might, um, if you haven't, um, if you don't find a partner for soap, but you you have a partner, maybe your partner can make soap and you can grow the loofahs. So the more to sell and give away, the more form of capital you have. And I just want to say, bless you all. A lot of you guys are growing for community gardens to give, you know, gleaning gardens to give for free. So bless all of you guys who are doing that because that is such uh, a necessary thing. And you can, uh, there's more in that system too that can be optimized where I can see in the community garden, even if it's just giving away for free, then everybody who gives away for who gets it should be invited into the garden to grow something, right? All these things that are turning in my head that hopefully are prompting your thoughts as well. Bill Mollison in his big black book that I am actually using as my book stand um, mentioned sustainability uh, as this small input when you're when the 
output of your system far exceeds the input of your system. And that's what we're looking at. Start with seeds. They're cheaper to buy than the actual seedlings, you know, compost, put that waste back into the system through composting. So focus on what you can change. In permaculture, we talk about small and slow solutions. Focus on what you can change. Maybe you're not a farmer, maybe you're a home grower. What can you change? Um, your schedule, <laughs> your consistency in doing the task of turning the compost, checking on the seedlings. What can you specialize in? If you are going to say tomato is my main cash crop this year, or loofah is my main cash crop this year, what one product, one channel, oh, let's say Instagram, right? If you're a farmer, one channel, your, your um, one audience, um, your local community or your Instagram community, you know, one year for one season. This is what Liz and I have been mulling over as, as much as we have our hands in several different things, which I'm sure you all do as well. But how can we streamline these and specialize and focus in on one thing that we really want to get good at so that we can actually get it done, get that one launched, get that one sold, um, or get good at growing that specific crop? Repurposing. So once again, that's that one element, multiple functions. We don't have to buy everything. We can use things. If we are marketing, and here's where the marketing comes in, um, to people who are on Instagram and we're, uh, we're doing it anyway. We're, we're planting anyway today. We might as well take a photo. We can use that photo over and over again to market on our brochures when we sell the stuff, when we have the loofah, <laughs> you know, take a cute picture and, and use that. Um, streamline your strategy, educate them about your product is really important. Clear, be clear over clever. Sometimes um, I'm thinking right now of uh, that. Yeah, sometimes it's really hard to educate when you are not clear over clever. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about somebody who gives advice on orcharding and all the <laughs> advice I had has like these clever titles and I cannot understand. I have to like read over and over again. Newsletter must if you are selling, even if you're not, if even if you're running a nonprofit, but you're trying to create a system within that garden gleaning um, community garden of yours, have a newsletter to tell people when the garden is open, what is ripe, you know, and what people might want to compost and the ability to pay you. Oh, the ability to pay you. <laughs> so meaning you have a way to accept money that um, Stripe or PayPal and then location is key. So like your location, some of you um, were saying how you were selling in the farmers markets, but we're not getting any buyers. If you would consider if farmers markets are the route that you want to go through, if you would consider moving to a farmers market where the population is is more um, robust. So I was thinking this person who had mentioned this in the um, initial survey um, was selling in a farmers market, and I I asked her if she wanted to go to Harrisonburg, which seemed like a bigger city. And questions. Liz, before questions, anything else you'd like to add? Nikki, I think you nailed it. And especially with the newsletter, just consistent communication is key. I did not mean for that to be so alliterative, but it was. Consistent communication is so important to both understanding your customer segments and your target market, and then being able to convey to them what it is you have to offer. Consistency above perfection for sure. Get that email out, get that thing posted, whatever you're doing, really done is better than perfect. So do it, get it consistent. Absolutely. And um, Della, thank you for sharing. ASD is the multi-million dollar USA program Appalachian Regional Food Business Center. So if anyone wants to call to get more technical assistance, business support, email me. Della, do you want a few moments to unmute yourself and share some of the resources that you give away? And is this only for the Appalachian region? And does, um, yeah. Can... Yeah, it's the Appalachian Regional Business Center. We are a sub-recipient at ASD um, for a, uh, the Central Appalachian Network is several uh, from, I don't know, Alabama to Ohio, maybe. 
uh, like covering the central Appalachian region. Um, so I'm not really sure, you know, exactly what that program is doing, but we won the grant. Uh, it's like a $42 billion the federal government gave away to build these regional food business centers. So the Appalachian region got one. So most everybody on this call is in the region. Uh, um, so if uh, the, the person who's heading that program up um, is out of town this week, but I can get, you know, forward any uh, interested folks onto her. Um, yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. I guess there are sub award grants to uh, entrepreneurs in food and agriculture production um, called business builder grants. So uh, normally grants are, uh, I'm actually the grant writer for ASD. And, and, and so I don't, I don't do a lot of field stuff except my own garden, but we got a lot of great programs and uh, please check out the website if you get a chance. But the, the, the really, the, the regional food business center grant is massive. So there's a lot of money coming in to start shoring up your farm enterprise, your small business, uh, and sort of get some of the support um, that you need. Uh, from whatever, you know, there's several partner organizations. So if you're way up, you know, not in the very tip of Southwest Virginia, like me, you know, in other parts of Virginia, you, there's a regional um, like affiliate that's part of the program too. So I can try and get you to the right people. Um, once that uh, grant gets released, it's not, it's not common to have a grant eligible for a business to apply uh, because most of the time they want the nonprofit application. So you know, for a grant to be opening for people with a business, that's massive, so. Wow, well, thank that. you for sharing that. I hope everybody saw Della's email so generously provided in the chat. Um, anybody else have any questions? No? Well, Liz, do you have any last words uh, no, I think that we covered, you know, we covered the the gist of it, Nikki. And well, I I would love before we well, let me share first where you can contact us because you won't forget. Uh, we covered what people want to buy, choosing your cash and supporting crops, how to maximize your profit, and we answered some. Well, we we featured questions and answers and resources thanks to Della and Brian, and this is how you can get in touch with us. So if it's in the growing area where you want to maximize your profit by growing more efficiently using permaculture systems, I am the person to take to take care of you. <laughs> and so you can, we have a new app called Permaculture Gardens. Our website is permaculturegardens.org. If you are looking for a farm assist, farm assistance through coaching, Liz advocacy, Liz is your person, networking, through different channels um, so you can get your customer base right so you can learn marketing liz is your girl and you can get her on oops nourishingliberty.com is that right that's correct or nourishingliberty at gmail nourishingliberty at gmail.com i'll put that in the chat or liz could you put that on the chat while i sure. thank you um before we go oh yeah that's that's my that's our app i hope you can um consider it if you guys are growing food and you're wondering how to keep track of all the record keeping and and this is nourishing liberty liz's website before we go can we just unmute and i mean un, uh, show our faces and i just wanted to do a quick uh photo op with all of you who are here yay okay liz how do i do a screenshot command my video doesn't work i'm sorry no worries no worries let me just um do you know how to do a screenshot <laughs> yes. here i'll do that yay <laughs> what is one takeaway that you have had from attending today i'm just really excited to know there's other people growing loofah in the world <laughs> oh my god and they happen to be on this call so how many more can they be can I love it. 
Nikki, I'm excited to see so many other people doing permaculture in their communities, giving food away to people in need. I think it's such an incredible and valuable thing that the world and our country needs right now. Absolutely. Thank you all for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Jessica, do you have any? I look, look for you in the chat. For personal gardening, Rachel says, thinking through expensive crops that are easy to grow, this will become a priority for me. And Vivian says, no matter what season, every bed should have a legume. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So Thank I you for organizing this. <laughs> oh, this is my pleasure. Thank you all for being here today. Um, you will get the recording of this soon after, and this will be broadcast on YouTube at 8 p.m. I hope you have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you next Wednesday for advanced permaculture design. We're, we're showing it, we're, we're doing two sessions, one at noon Eastern, and then eight hours after with live with my teacher, Wayne Wiseman. So that's really exciting for me. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Bye. Bye.